it's great to see everybody here this morning. I want to thank uh, everyone for being here. We have not done a public safety briefing since um, earlier this summer. As you know, I like to do these. So you're going to see these for the rest of the month through the end of the year. Um, I'm joined by uh, members of my team, uh, Victor Saunders, who's going somewhere. I don't know where Victor's going. OK. Oh, Victor's going to the other side. Victor Saunders, um, Mike Soretto, director of 911, Ms. Sierra, who's our PIO from the um, Rochester Fire Department, uh, my emergency manager, Fred Ryan, commissioner of neighborhood and business development, Dana Miller, Zeke Tooks, um, Office of Violence Prevention, uh, leads our Pathways to Peace efforts and all of our violence reduction efforts, uh, Chief Villa, filling in for um, Chief Napolitano, Corporation Counsel Patrick Beef, Chief Dave Smith, I got the whole Calvary here today, Commissioner Shirley Green, Department of Recreation and Human Services, Aaliyah Hinton-Williams, our Crisis Service Areas and PIC, um, our Commissioner of the Department of Environmental Services, Rich Perrin, and Special Advisor to the Mayor on Violence Prevention, who I mentioned before, Victor Saunders. I want to thank you all for coming here, and um, I want to thank my team uh, for working with me to make sure we keep uh, the community informed about our progress on reducing gun violence and improving public safety. So we're here today to provide an update on those items, and you will hear from um, some of the folks that are here today. And this assembly provides a visual demonstration that public safety and violence prevention remains in all hands on deck here at the city of Rochester. Nobody here says it's not my job when it comes to public safety. It's everybody's job because every department in City Hall has a role to play in our strategy of prevention, intervention, suppression, and accountability. It's everybody's job and it's everybody's highest priority. As you've heard me say, we are working to create a safe, equitable, and prosperous Rochester by inspiring hope and delivering on opportunity. Before we go any further with this update, I want to make one thing very clear. We're going to be talking a lot about the numbers today, but these numbers are not the goal. They're measurements of progress toward that goal of making Rochester a safer city. Again, we're going to be talking a lot about numbers today, but the numbers are not the goal. They're measurements of progress toward that goal of making Rochester a safer city. A city is only safer, a city that, a city that not only is safer, but feels safer. That's what we want. Because when it comes to public safety, as I've learned anything in this job in the last three, two years and nine months, is that perception is just as important as reality. There is not a day that goes by that I'm not reminded of the human suffering that lies beneath these numbers. They keep me up at night. And I personally know many of those who have been affected by gun violence and have gotten to know many more in the aftermath of many of these incidences. That's why it matters to me. I got a political science degree. I've spent a lot of time in public service. But I can tell you that there is nothing in a textbook or nothing that any of you would write about or get on the news and talk about that prepares you for what it's like to talk to mothers and fathers of murder victims or victims of opioid overdoses or fatal hit and runs or all types of other heinous acts that I've seen, some of the most heinous crimes that have happened in this city, I've seen and I've talked to people about. But these numbers do serve as a valuable purpose because they tell us whether our strategies to reduce gun violence are working. And today, I am pleased to say, the numbers are telling us that one critical component of that strategy is working the gun violence state of emergency that I, that I declared two years ago. We will never be satisfied with any level of gun violence. But one key milestone we've had since we've initiated the state of emergency has been to bring gun violence back to pre-pandemic levels. If you look at that chart over there by uh, Mike, our director of uh, emergency uh, ECD, it shows you um, where we are and how we, where we were at the peak and where we are falling. 
And today, I'm pleased to re report that milestone is well within sight. In fact, we are now at the upper reaches of that milestone. As I said, at that chart on the right, you see a metric that is showing us how we're doing on that objective, the 365-day rolling average of shootings. This metric essentially, essentially treats every day of the year as if it were the last 365-year day period and calculates the average number of shootings for that given year. This is a useful measure because it eliminates many of the variations that occur when you measure your progress by the standard calendar year. And because, unfortunately, as mayor, I'm held to a higher standard, if it was someone else standing here and they had a year-over-year -year decrease, people would be like, oh, that's great. But for some reason, the goalposts get moved. And this happens a lot when you have, I, I, when you have mayor sometimes. But I guess people just hold me to a higher standard. That's okay. So because of that, we have this 365-year um, calendar that, that's there. But using this measure, we see that over the five years, because people say, oh, okay, you got it down in two years in a row, Mayor. What about the last five years? Well, look at that chart there. We see that over five years leading up to the pandemic, shootings declined from a high point of about 225 per year to about 150 a year. And as of last week, we are now at the upper end of that band at about 210. And that's less than half of what it was at the peak of the pandemic in 2021, when the average number was just under 430 shootings per year. Even on a human scale, that is still a significant decline. That's 200 less people that did not experience the trauma of gun violence. And gun violence is a trauma. It's something that we cannot tolerate. And it's why you hear the chief talk about how I have instructed him to treat every single act of gun violence as if it were a homicide, as if it were a homicide. Before, we weren't doing that. Anybody that uses a gun or is a victim of gun violence, we treat it as a homicide, even if they choose not to cooperate. So we want to make sure that we continue to still send the message that even if someone is not killed by a gun and are just shot by a gun, that there was a still life-altering results. So, but that less than 200 acts of violence that didn't happen, that helps stop the, the cycle of retaliation that drives more gun violence. And that 365 day rolling average isn't just the only measure that tells us our strategies are working. Another metric we use is the, another metric we use to measure the current state against the five year average of crime that preceded it. Again, because that eliminates a lot of the variables that show up year to year by other comparisons. But let's talk about part one crime, which is down 20%. And the chief can talk to you about what part one crime is. Murder is down 18%, shootings are down 34%, and violent crime is down 8%. Property crime is down 22%. And as I've said before, I am not gratified, but I, I am not, I am gratified, but not satisfied by these numbers. We are not jumping up and down. But the reason why I have to make sure I put these numbers out there is because we have to make sure that we are communicating on a regular basis on what these numbers are. And sometimes I'm reluctant to say, look, we had 200 less shootings than we had at the, high, at the peak. But it's still important to put them out there because people need to know the facts. I'm gratified that our strategies are working and Rochester is on our way to becoming a city where people are safe and feel safe. We have to still continue to work on the feel safe part of this equation. You're going to hear some updates from other leaders on what they're doing as it relates to public safety and particularly as it relates to the gun violence emergency. Now, I said that um, I might have brought the gun violence emergency and, and moved it, scaled it back, but I'm not going to do that because I'm still not satisfied. We still got a lot more work to do so that gun violence emergency will stay in effect. It's been a very valuable tool for me to be able to get ahead of a lot of the nonsense that we have that takes place particularly um, at gatherings and places that have become, become hotbeds for violence. Chief Smith and Corporation Counsel Beef will talk about suppression and accountability. Dr. Green, Zeke Tooks, and, De and Deputy Fire Chief will talk about what they're doing on the intervention front. And we're gonna start with Chief Smith, who, whose remarks will include what we're doing, uh, particularly in entertainment districts, where, where people think that they can come and interrupt people having a good time. We are not gonna tolerate that, let me be clear. We want people to have a good time in Rochester, but if you think you can come and carry a firearm in the open and, and, and interrupt the vast majority of Rochesterians that are going out to have a good time over the weekend, 
you got another thing coming. And you'll see this weekend what we're going to do about it. We are not going to tolerate it. We saw what happened with my colleague in Alabama over the weekend. We don't want that to happen here in Rochester. And if, you, if you're going to the entertainment district, you should be going to have a good time. Not because you want to go and wreak havoc. One person ruins it for everybody else, and we're tired of it. We want, we want people to be able to go out to the bars and clubs and have a good time and not have one or two people come in there we can have it. So the chief will talk about what we're doing this weekend there. It is going to be a little bit inconvenient, but it's important because we have to send the message that we're not going to have people coming to our entertainment districts cutting up. We just can't have it. So with that, I'll have uh, the chief um, say a few words, and then we'll go over to our corporation council. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first off, I would be remiss in my job as Chief of Police if I did not uh, call everyone's attention to the tragic death in the line of duty of Oswego County Sheriff's Deputy Kaylee Campbell yesterday. Our thoughts and prayers are with her family and our family in Oswego County. So where to start for the public safety briefing? Um, so many good things, so much going on as a department, it's, it's hard to capture in a, a brief presser like this. By the numbers, currently we are at 156 shooting victims compared to 234 at this time last year. We've had 211 shooting victims in the last 365 days, which as the mayor said is our lowest 365 day mark since July of 2020. Currently homicides are at 42 compared to 49 at this time last year, although you know, it is significant to note that uh, a significant portion of these are the result of domestic disputes and um, violent disputes as opposed to results of gun violence as we've seen previous years. So how have we been reducing these numbers? Well, we've been getting guns off the streets. Year to date, we've gotten 573 firearms off the streets of Rochester, including 55 ghost guns, which as you know, our guns that are manufactured and do not have serial numbers cannot be registered. We are holding those that commit violence in our city accountable. This year alone, we have made over 750 arrests for criminal possession of a weapon related offenses. Currently, we have a 75% closure rate for our homicides with several additional rates, arrests, sorry, forthcoming. Our non-fatal shootings unit, again, our pilot program that we started last year in partnership with the district attorney's office has led to more than a 25% closure rate in cases that we've partnered on. And again, before this initiative, we were at about 10%. So where do we go from here? Well, as the mayor mentioned, the East End Entertainment District continues to be an issue. We've been working extensively with property owners in the area to make it a safe place that it needs to be so people can go and have a good time. This weekend, we will be using the gun violence emergency. We will have an increase in officers and security personnel, and access to the area will be restricted to those 21 and over only. Our violence prevention section, again, which we started last year as a result of our reorganization, has partnered with New York State for another new initiative, the Group Violence Intervention Program. We will be working with intelligence-based data not only to target specific individuals, as I've talked about before, but we're going to work towards targeting groups that are bringing organized violence to our community. Again, that is the Group Violence Intervention Program. This also includes utilizing the powers of the federal government to continue bringing federal charges against the most violent offenders. Currently, there are still over 51 offenders in the county jail being held under federal charges. We're going to continue to build our relationships with our community. Just last week, we became one of, if not the first police agency to bring an HBCU classic football games to the city of Rochester. Deputy Chief Stith and his staff organized a series of community building events for the Weekend of Hope that brought thousands of residents together, which culminated in the Frederick Douglass classic football game on Saturday. Around 7,000 people 
attended and watched two HBCU schools battle it out right here in Rochester. This was brought to our community by the Rochester Police Department in partnership with our sponsors, City School District. Far too many people I can mention here, but again, I can't say enough, it was Chief Stith's idea that he brought to the forefront. We recognize that we have to partner with our community to solve crime, and events such as these are an unprecedented step toward building these relationships. We can't solve crime alone, as I've said many times, nor are we going to arrest our way out of the problems that our city faces. We need the trust and the help of our community. In these events, we're a giant step in the right direction. I messed you up, sorry. Thank you, Chief. Um, and just let me say, uh, you know, one of the things I will say is, you heard the number of arrests that we've had as it relates to criminal possession of a weapon. We need those cases to be adjudicated faster. So I got some problems with, with, with that, but that's for another press conference. We, we, we would have even better numbers, I believe, if uh, we were able to adjudicate cases related to criminal possession of a weapon. We're getting people off the street, but we need to make sure that they move through the court system more expeditiously. Too slow, on my, in, in, my, in my opinion, way too slow. Um, so I wanna thank the chief for uh, his work. And I wanna have uh, Corporation Counsel Patrick Beeth will talk about the law department and how they're put, using my gun violence state of emergency uh, to hold owners of properties that are the nexus of violence accountable. I am still amazed that people think that they could host illegal gatherings and, um, you know, ha let people bring in firearms and think they're going to get away with it and think we're not going to do anything about it. Those days are over. We are not going to tolerate that in the city as long as I have the power under the gun violence emergency. And we've taken proactive steps to make sure that that happens. And I want Patrick to detail some of the cases in which we use the gun violence emergency. Um, and the chief talked about how we're going to use it this weekend, again. So, uh, Corporation Council. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as the mayor said, gun violence numbers are improving, but we still have a gun violence emergency in this city. Um, and we continue, the mayor continues, to proclaim that emergency, which gives him unique powers to ensure that places of assembly that get out of control, that don't have adequate security, uh, that are not making sure that they're creating a safe space for people to gather and to have a good time, we can hold them accountable. We can hold them accountable by making them change hours, by shutting them down altogether if necessary. In the past year, since the beginning of 2024, we've closed nine locations using the mayor's emergency order. Um, we've brought three of those locations or continued with three of those locations in actions in Supreme Court to ensure that we have some judicial monitoring on some of the worst of the worst. And we've entered into three significant nuisance abatement agreements where folks have agreed to shut down. I'm going to highlight a few of those. Uh, at 186 Hollenbeck, we had an individual running an illegal nightclub called Da Garage. This was not a new problem. They were running Da Garage back in 2022. There were shooting incidents, and they were shut down. They were shut down, and they agreed to an abatement agreement whereby they would stay shut down. But earlier this year, they violated that agreement, and they started holding these parties again, disturbing the neighborhood and bringing violence to the neighborhood. This time, we went further than a voluntary agreement. We shut them down with the mayor's emergency order. We took them to court, and they realized as soon as we got into court with them that they didn't have a chance. So they agreed to a consent judgment which will be overseen by the judge, which requires them to deconvert the garage, take out the bar, close the garage for a year, take down the illegal roof deck that they had built, and never hold nightclub-like parties at that premises again. Another example of how we've used the emergency order where things get out of hand is at Casa Campo. Earlier this year, there were a couple of weekends where at the restaurant Casa Campo, dozens if not hundreds of illegal dirt bikes and ATVs gathered uh, and were a menace to the neighborhood. When police tried to break it up, our officers were injured, arrests were made, uh, including arrests for criminal possession of a weapon. We issued an emergency order to shut that activity down, and then we got the cooperation of the owner of the building and of the restaurant to agree that they would stay closed at least until November of this year to all on-premise service. Nobody's to be in the parking lot. They're doing only takeout service. And in that way, we managed to allow their business to continue 
while shutting down that nuisance activity. Finally, I want to highlight King and Queen restaurant and club. Earlier this year, we had a double homicide at that location um, because they didn't have adequate security as they were hosting these events in the evening. We pulled their entertainment license so they can no longer act as uh, a place of amusement. Since then, they've agreed to a, an abatement and a conditional business permit where they agree not to have those parties and it's been quiet. They're a restaurant, they're a benefit to the community, they're no longer in danger. So we look forward to being able to continue to exercise this emergency authority to address these places that get out of hand. Um, and as the chief and the mayor have said, we'll be using that this weekend in the East End to limit access and make sure that that whole area stays peaceful and welcoming for the folks who are out looking to have a good time. Thank you. Thank you, Corporation Council Beath. Um, in many cases, the differences between a shooting and a homicide can be a matter of minutes or a matter of inches. And that's because for every shooting that happens, our firefighters are among the first on the scene to provide the life-saving measures that prevent many of these incidences from becoming homicides. Deputy Chief Villa is here to tell us and to tell you more about the training and equipment that enables the Rochester Fire Department to provide this element of our violence reduction and prevention strategy. Chief. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the Rochester Fire Department plays a critical role in responding to gun-related injuries, demonstrating its commitment to public safety and incident stabilization. The department has consistently implemented industry standard practices proven to increase survivability rates of these high stakes and stressful situations. Our firefighters are fully trained and equipped to perform essential life-saving interventions, including wound packing, tourniquet application, and the use of occlusive dressings to manage life-threatening injuries. The Rochester Fire Department and its ambulance providers value its partnership with the Rochester Police Department, who ensure a scene safety so our personnel can tend to these patients at these incidents. These measures provide patients with the best possible chance of survival. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chief Villa, and thank you for all um, that the uh, fire department does. They are literally sometimes the first on the scene uh, to help stop, uh, literally to stop the bleeding and um, making sure people survive their injuries. Um, so I thank you. Now we're going to move on to the work that's taking place in the Department of Recreation and Human Services to re reduce violence through our prevention and intervention. But I first want to note the presence of the commissioners of two other departments that are an important part of public safety through violence prevention and intervention by deliver equity and prosperity to our residents. Commissioner Dana Miller, uh, Commissioner of the Department of Neighborhood and Business Development, and Rich Perrin, the Commissioner of the Department of Environmental Services. These two departments are making significant progress to build pride in our neighborhoods, which is an important element of the three-legged stool of a safe, equitable, and prosperous Rochester. We're going to be making some exciting announcements on those fronts in the coming weeks, including work that will get neighbors more involved in the success of their neighborhoods and expanding home ownership and support for small landlords. So stay tuned for that. I will add that we had uh, some issues around partial five with people thinking they could drag race. Well, guess what? They can't drag race anymore there. If they do, they're probably going to go airborne and their cars are going to get destroyed. We got tons of complaints of people thinking they could drag race around parcel five, which is a jewel in our community. So we made sure, thank you, Commissioner Perrin, um, that we have what I call um, proofed that area to stop speeding in the middle of downtown Rochester. But that is also part of our public safety. Too many people have been hit by vehicles. We have too much of drag racing. We wanted to make sure we took care of that. So I thank the commissioner for that. Now I turn it over to Dr. Green, who will tell you more about the ongoing work in the city's R centers to focus on the role of childhood trauma and violence and prevention and intervention. Dr. Green. Thank you, Mayor. As the Mayor said, the Department of Recreation and Human Services is deeply committed to our role in reducing violence, especially for our children. Every child has a right to live their life without fear that they or someone they love will become a victim of violence. And every child has a right to live their lives free from the trauma that violence can inflict on them and their family and their friends. And the important 
of the work has brought into stark relief in August when one of our own Recreation Center employees, Tyasia Manning, lost her life during the tragic shooting at Maplewood Park. Not only was the loss directly felt by Tyasia's colleagues at the Rec Center, it was also felt by the young people. We got to see the immediate impact it had on the children after they learned their beloved Mama Bear had been taken from them. And I can tell you this incident has inspired us to redouble our commitment to addressing the trauma we know is driving so much of this violence. As we already reported, the Department of Recreation and Human Services has contracted with the Center for Youth to provide mental health services in our recreation centers. And the more we work with this team, the more we realize just how important this service is for our children and families. From April to June of this year, these counselors engaged with 178 youth for a total of 5,136 encounters or engagements. And 98% of these encounters were self-referrals. That means the young people asked for the help. Topics of discussion have included anger management, bullying, relationships, and decision-making skills. Counselors have talked to the children whose parents struggle with addiction, children whose behavior changes after a parent is incarcerated, children who don't feel safe in their own home, children who know they are at the brink of homelessness. These stories are absolutely heartbreaking. But what's even more heartbreaking is knowing there are countless children in our community who are coping with struggles like these and haven't found someone to talk to. My staff and I are grateful for this opportunity to help the children we serve in such meaningful ways. This truly is God's work. And this is just a, one part of our overall plan to support our children. As the mayor often says, the best way to keep a child out of trouble is to give them a, a job and teach them how to put money in their own pocket and savings account. That's what we did this summer for almost 500 youth through our Summer of Opportunity, through our Rock MBK Brothers, My Brother's Keeper program, and our Youth Voice One Vision programs. And we're continuing to evaluate the programs we offer at the rec centers to make sure they remain relevant and interesting for all children. There, this isn't just about fun and games. It's fun and games with a modern twist. Fun and games geared toward positive growth and development of the child. We adopted an outdoor bill of rights to make sure children have the opportunity to explore their natural environment. We offer skateboarding classes because a child with a skateboard can make new friends wherever they go. We have art classes and cooking classes. We have robotics teams and dance teams. And just this week, City Council approved our request for funding to bring eSports into the recreation centers with a team in every location. This is going to attract a whole new group of young people and bring more young people into the recreation centers where they'll be exposed to more opportunities to learn and grow than they, have, they can possibly imagine. It can be painful to see what some of our children in our city have to deal with. That's why my staff and I have learned to celebrate our successes whenever and wherever we find them. Those successes can be found in the raw data of children who seek out mental health counseling services while in the recreation center. Or they can be found right in our email inboxes with notes like the one I received last week from a mother of one of the children we, ser we serve. And this is what she said. My son has been attending different classes run through the recreational centers for about two or three years. He actually learned how to ride a two-wheeler bicycle at a lesson. As a mother and resident of the city, it is nice to be able to put him into things like soccer, basketball, skateboarding at no cost to me. Thank you for offering these things to the children in Rochester. To this mother and every other parent who entrusts their children to the recreation centers, I say, you're welcome. The pleasure is all ours. Thank you for this opportunity to tell you about the wonderful things at the City of Rochester's recreation centers. Now I'll turn it back over to Mayor Evans. Thank you, Commissioner.
um, is prevention, intervention, suppression, accountability. And you know, this esports thing we are very, very excited about. We think Rochester could be on the map for esports. Um, I, I, I won. I, I beat a kid pretty, pretty good in the Madden game at my uh, second Madden tournament that we had um, a couple of weeks ago at Jackson R Center. Um, but we have some good gamers in this community, and it gives them the opportunity to really do it in a fun, in a fun environment, but also their learning skills. So esports, stay tuned for that. I want Rochester to be the mecca for esports, and that starts when they're young. And that's a preventative effort because all those kids that were participating in that tournament, that meant that they weren't hanging out and getting into trouble. They were meeting new friends and playing in a tournament where they got some great projects, uh, where, they, where, they got, where they made great progress on their game and, and got some nice prizes. Now Zeke Tooks, the director um, who's in our Office of Violence Prevention, um, and particularly uh, around, he, he, he uh, oversees our Peace Collective and Pathways to Peace and Advanced Peace, uh, will come and talk to you about um, the work that is taking place uh, amongst those programs. And uh, you may have heard earlier uh, in the summer, later in the summer, uh, towards the end of the summer, we talked about um, our school-based program and how that was going to be expanding. And Zeke gave an outline on that. He's now here. He can give you an update on that piece. Mr. Tooks. Thank you, Mayor Evans. And good morning, everyone that's here. The work being done by the Mayor's Office of Violence Prevention is all about making real action in both prevention and intervention, so that we can make a real difference in reducing violence and improving life for all Rochester families. This past summer, Pathways to Peace held peace barbecues all over the city in each quadrant. Although we were chilling and grilling, we were also making and building relationships with a lot of the families in, in those communities. We also hosted late night basketball, uh, where we were giving our young people something positive to do while staying safe and off the old streets during those late night hours. Like Mayor Evans always says, I want our youth to be so busy that when they get home, they're too tired to get in trouble. And that's exactly what we did. That's exactly what we made happen. As we embark on a new school year, Pathways to Peace has launched a new proactive case management outreach program that's based inside of our city schools. We now have nine Pathways to Peace workers that are in nine, across nine schools focused on helping our students who need the most support. Our school-based staff are inside these schools doing everything they can to make sure our students succeed. Our staff are keeping track with school attendance and making sure, making home visits when they don't see the kids to make sure they're coming to school to encourage them to stay in class. Holding, workshop, ho holding workshops on leadership, conflict resolution, and essential life skills, all those skills that we know that will help them be a productive adults. Staying in constant contact with parents and guardians to discuss students' progress, um, as well as talk through any concerns they may have. It's important that we celebrate those, mil those milestones and those successes that they have. We, also, we are also in the schools partnering with teachers, counselors, and administrators to build those support plans for each student. Also advocating for students in those school meetings that we know a lot of our students may need the most support. The Mayor's Office of Violence Prevention is also pushing forward with our Advanced Peace, Peacemaker Fellowship. This program focuses on those, those in our community who may be at the heart of violent activities, encouraging them to make better choices and, live in a, live, live help more, uh, and to live a more positive lifestyle. These fellows, as we call them, they receive care mentorship, employment support, employment support, cognitive behavior training, support with groceries, transportation to their appointments like interviews, the list goes on. And we're seeing results. In the city's 10th ward, homicides have dropped by 75%. Aggravated assaults are down by 70%. That's real progress, but that's also what it looks like when we work together. Speaking of working together in partnerships, I'm also excited to announce that we have 12 new gra grassroots organizations and agencies joining our Rochester Peace Collective, bringing us to 23. These groups are on the ground advancing violence prevention through services like emotional support, community outreach, job training, youth development, and more. The Office of Violence Prevention is thankful for their commitment to invest in our community. As we move forward, the Mayor's Office of Violence Prevention will continue to assess and analyze where violent crime is happening for a more, t more targeted approach so we can better allocate our resources. The Office of Violence Prevention, or OVP as we call it, our overall goal is to make our city safe for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Zeke. I greatly appreciate uh, all of the work that is taking place um, in your shop. Um, we continue to look for ways to find these resources. Vic Saunders has been to uh, Washington, D.C. and Albany and other places to make sure that this work, can, uh, that this, this work can continue. So we have a great team 
of folks here at the city who are moving in different directions, because they all play a different role, they have a different role, but we're rowing in the same direction. Get that? Collaboration. We're working together, not me, but we. I can't do this alone, and I'm so thankful for these folks here. I'm going to take some questions uh, in a second, but I want to remind everyone that this is a team effort. And I'm deeply, deeply grateful for our many partners in law enforcement at the state, federal level who contribute to the declines that we talk about today. Uh, Rochester is one of the only cities that has an ATF agent on call 24-7. Um, we have made public safety a top priority regularly. I meet with all of our partners, from the U.S. Attorney to ATF to Monroe County Sheriffs, New York State Police, Rochester Police Department, our, um, our partners that help us measure items, RIT. So this is a huge, huge, gargantuan effort, and it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work. You just can't put it on social media or just come out there and say it. It's a lot of work that goes beyond, behind the scenes because public safety is complex because you're dealing with human behavior. I also want to recognize, as uh, Zeke mentioned, the many nonprofit and business partners who work with us day in and day out to create a safe, equitable, and prosperous Rochester. That we could not do it without them. They work with us hand in hand. And I thank the people of Rochester for continuing to do their part to improve the city every day, particularly, particularly given tips because they've had enough. You saw the clearance rate is up. And that is because of our partners. And our partners are the citizens. They've had enough of this. They're, they're, they're done with it. They're sick of it. And um, I'm with them. I'm with them. And the vast majority of people in our community, not some, some still want to coddle people, but the vast majority of, in, our, in our community have said enough is enough. They want their neighborhoods back. Um, they're tired of it. They're tired of neighborhoods being overrun by people who uh, often aren't from their neighborhoods that come and wreak havoc. Um, and we are working to get it back under control. We still have a long way to go. No, in no way are we celebrating um, the numbers that we announced today, and we'll do another an announcement. We'll keep tracking these numbers like, like we do this every month, um, and we'll, we'll continue to update the community. I want to thank the media also um, for being here today.